If we're not careful, you and I could have an attitude of spiritual superiority towards people who don't know Jesus. Once upon a time, you and I were as blind as anybody else in our spirit. So let us be humble. Let's not forget the fact that you and I were just as spiritually blind as the next person who does not yet know Jesus. Let me begin by asking you this question. If the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> were to appear in front of you right now, what is the first thing you would say or do? Now imagine, let me paint the picture a little bit more clearly. Forget about all of the other people in this auditorium. Let's say everybody's gone except you. You get the picture? It is just you in this room. And all of a sudden, the Lord Jesus appears in front of you. What is the first thing you will do or say? But it sort of gives us an idea of how we view the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder what we would do. The message for this morning, brothers, sisters, guests, people watching us online, is this. Respond. Again, it is a response to who God is. It's a response to His sovereignty. It's a response to His grace. And the response we're talking about today is a humble response. Last week, we talked about being grateful. Today, we talk about being humble. After all, it makes sense. Grateful people are humble people. And humble people are grateful people. Three reasons to respond humbly to the grace of God. The first one is we are grafted by God. Okay, grafting. We're included in that family. The second reason are the guarantees of God. Two thumbs up for our Savior. Hallelujah. And finally, the third reason to respond humbly to the grace of God is He deserves all the glory. Glory to God. It says in Romans 11 verse 17, But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant. Remember, respond humbly to the grace of God. The first reason is grafted by God. It says, but if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Again, by way of review, the branches that were broken off, these are the Jewish people who rejected the gospel, who rejected being in a, in a relationship with God, who rejected Jesus as Messiah. It says they were broken off. And then you, addressing the Gentiles, he says, being a wild olive, the, the, the olive tree is supposed to be a cultivated olive tree. Then he says to the Gentiles, you are wild olives, and yet, although this is not the normal practice of a farmer, you were grafted in to a cultivated olive tree in spite of the fact that you were a wild olive. By the way, how many of you here, before you came to know Jesus as your Savior, you were living a wild life? We may have, um, <laughs> okay, join the club, folks. That's in the past. That is the grace of God. Hallelujah. In spite of what we used to be, we are now grafted. So, and then became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree. So the message is do not be arrogant toward the branches. Don't think, don't look down at them. Don't say, oh, this is their fault. You know, I'm a better person, and that's why I've been grafted in. That is not the point. It is all by grace. Here you have a picture of an olive tree, and this is kind of how the grafting takes place. Okay? I'm not an expert, but at least visually, you have some idea of how this works. But again, the message is do not be arrogant. Respond humbly to the fact that you and I have been grafted in. The, many of the Jews rejected Jesus. Those branches were broken off, and the Gentiles were grafted in. By the way, are there any Gentiles in this room? Any Gentiles in this room? 
Okay, let's make sure we understand this. To the Jew, there are only two kinds of people in the world, the Jews and the rest of the world. So the rest of the world are what? Gentiles. So any Gentiles in the room? Very good. Now we know where we stand. And we know that this is, we are the ones that this is talking about. So the message is, be humble. Do not be arrogant, especially do not be arrogant towards the branches that were broken off. What's the application to us today? You know, today, if we're not careful, you and I could have an attitude of spiritual superiority towards people who don't know Jesus. Sometimes we'll think, you know, they're so devoted, they're so stuck with their religion. How can they be so narrow-minded? You know, and how can they not understand so clearly in the Bible when you look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says you are saved by faith. Or when you look at John chapter 14, you're, you know, Jesus says, I am the way, no one comes to the Father except through me. Folks, let's not forget, once upon a time, you and I were as blind as anybody else in our spirit. Once upon a time, we were stuck and so hopelessly devoted to whatever our belief system was. Once upon a time, somebody showed you a verse from the Bible and it did not make sense to you. Am I right or am I correct? So let us be humble. Let's not forget the fact that you and I were just as spiritually blind as the next person who does not yet know Jesus. Now, the, the generally accepted summary of Paul's illustration about the, the olive tree is that the root, okay, he talks about the root supporting the entire tree. That refers to Abraham, or if you like, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promises that God made to them once upon a time. We'll be looking at those promises a little bit later on. The olive tree, of course, is the collective people of God. The natural branches were the Jews. The natural branches that were cut off were the Jews that rejected the Messiah, and the grafted wild branches are the Gentile believers, or at least those who claim to know Jesus. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. Again, Paul is still warning against being proud. He says, yes, you're right. Branches were broken off that you might be grafted in, but remember, they were broken off because of their unbelief. They were not broken off to make room for you because you are a better person. No. He says, remember, you stand by your faith. It is all by grace through faith. And it will be the same for the Jews who eventually put their faith in Yeshua as their Messiah. Again, he says, do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold, and Pastor Peter talked quite a bit about this last Sunday. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. You, Gentiles, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Now, that sounds kind of scary, <clears throat> and this brings many times people to a debate about can you lose your salvation or is eternal security the norm of God? You know, we will not get into that debate, but what I believe this verse is really warning us about. Remember, he's saying, do not be arrogant, do not be conceited, meaning to say, do not be presumptuous about the faith you claim to have. Because there are many people in this world, maybe even some in this room today, who claim to be followers of Jesus, but are not. Because their life does not show it. Because they believe that their Christianity is based on the things they do, on the righteousness that they believe they achieve. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus talks about a wedding feast that a man held for his son in, um, in celebration of his wedding. So this man, the father, sent out his slaves to the people whom he invited. And he was saying, the banquet is on. Please, you whom I have invited, come and celebrate with me. But 
Those who were invited refused to come. For one reason or another, they had many excuses. They said, I'm busy or I don't want to go. And some of them were actually even very hostile in their response to the, the father's invitation to come to the banquet. Long story short, you can read the parable on your own, Matthew 22. Long story short, the king was enraged. And so what he did was he decided to invite all kinds of other people to the banquet. Does it sound familiar? Does it sound to you like the branches being broken off and then people being grafted in? Yeah, it's the same. It's pretty much the same idea. So he invited all kinds of other people to join the wedding feast, just like the Gentiles who heard the gospel after the Jews had rejected it. But there was a problem. Jesus said, the king, the father, noticed one man who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And so he sharply rebuked that man and had him removed from the wedding feast. That guy right there. What does this remind us of? Well, it reminds us of two things. Number one, we become part of God's family only by grace. We never qualify for it. It is not a matter of merit. We never earn our salvation. We never earn our way to heaven. It is 101% by the grace of God. And if we think we can be part of his wedding banquet eventually through the things we do, the Bible says even our righteous acts are like what? Do you remember? The Bible says even our righteous acts are like filthy rags, just like what this man was wearing. We cannot qualify for heaven by our own actions because even our righteous acts are like filthy rags. The second thing that this reminds us of is that if we are truly followers of Jesus, it doesn't mean that we will live a perfect life, but it should mean that we are beginning to live a transformed life. The evidence of the inward change, it was, it's what happens in our outward everyday life. So the question is, are you and I becoming more like Jesus? And that's why it's so important to be part of a small group. And if that small group can be your own family, so much the better to be accountable, to have a safe place where people can tell you what they observe about your life and you can do the same for them. And you can encourage one another, even as the, dra the day draws near, as the Bible says, to become more and more like Jesus. Let's go to the next reason. Three reasons to respond humbly. The first is we are grafted by God. The second are the guarantees of God, the guarantees. Folks, has someone made promises to you but did not keep them? Has that happened to you? You feel betrayed, you feel let down, especially if that person is someone well known to you or maybe even related to you. Well, folks, the other reason to respond humbly to the grace of God is that God is not just a promise-making God. He is a what? A promise? A promise-keeping God. That's right. So let's continue now in Romans 11. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. Now, when you see the word mystery, usually in the New Testament, it means something that was hidden, unknown in the Old Testament, but is now being revealed in the new. So for you and me today, it is no longer a total mystery. It doesn't necessarily mean we understand every single uh, working or moving part, but at least it is clear to us what God's plan is. So he says, I don't want you to be uninformed of this mystery again so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Remember, Paul was addressing a predominantly Gentile audience who was potentially being proud or arrogant against the Jewish believers or the Jews, right? So he's saying, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. So what is that mystery that Paul is talking about? 
that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Wow! What is this talking about? Okay, first Paul talks about a partial hardening. Hardening means callousness, but it also means blindness. Remember earlier we talked about a spiritual blindness. The Bible tells us that even for non-Jews, it says the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that we will not believe the gospel. It's really a spiritual issue. But going back, it says a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. So it is a partial hardening. It is not something that will last forever. God has a plan and a promise for the salvation of the Jews. Now, why does that mean anything to you and to me today? Wait long. We'll find out together. So a partial hardening has happened to Israel. And you see this word, until. That's why you know it's not forever. Until what? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, what does that mean? Well, the word fullness means a sum total, a full complement, a completion, or an abundance. We cannot entirely explain what that means. But you and I know that someday God's plan for the salvation of the Gentiles will be complete. When exactly that will happen, how it will happen, you know, versus the rapture and the timing of the rapture and all of these things, let's not even get into that. The only thing clear is that God has a plan for you and God has a plan and a promise for the Jewish nation. So, what more can we say about this partial hardening? Before we get there, again, remember, it is the same thing even for you and for me. Look at what Paul wrote to the Gentiles in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, meaning Gentiles who are not yet followers of Jesus. So he's telling his audience, do not walk or live like them, because that's how you used to be once upon a time. In the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of what? The hardness of their heart. In other words, folks, yes, there is a partial hardening that is taking place among the Jewish people. But let's not forget, uh, like we said earlier, once upon a time, our hearts were hard too. And if you're here this morning, maybe you've been coming to CCF for a while, maybe this is your first time, or maybe you're joining us online, and you sense a hardness in your heart. You sense the Lord speaking to you. You sense that somehow your being here today is not an accident. I pray that the grace of God will open your hardened heart and that you will come to know Jesus as your Savior. Let's go back to Romans 11. We're talking about the guarantees of God, right? Okay, verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written. Now remember, when Paul cites these passages, they are from the where? They're from the Old Testament. Yeah. So just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob, which is another name for Israel. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. God's guarantees. That's another reason why we should respond humbly to His grace. Now, where do these come from? We said they come from the Old Testament. Where exactly? Just a summary. Isaiah 59, 20. A Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 31. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 27. Therefore, through this, Jacob's iniquity will be forgiven 
and this will be the full price of the pardoning of his sin. See, Paul took these passages and he put them together and he showed them that this is indeed God's promise to Israel. So let's go back. Ito na. And so all Israel will be saved. Oh? What does that mean? All? Well, folks, this debate will go on for a long, long time until we finally see with our own eyes what this really meant. But let me try and summarize what, you know, what it means to us today. There are probably four possible understandings of what that means. All Israel will be saved. The first one, which really does not merit you know, anything, it says, all Jews that ever lived are automatically saved. Obviously, that does not make sense. There are people, uh, Jewish people throughout history, even during the Exodus, who rejected God, who were idolatrous, and who died in that condition. So number one is untenable. Number two, Pastor Peter mentioned last Sunday, all Israel means the church replaces Israel and is composed of Jews and Gentiles saved through all generations. Uh, that also is untenable because even in Romans, Paul refers to the Jews as they, them, as a separate entity. So this replacement theology is also untenable, which leaves us with numbers three and four. Okay, so number three, the chosen remnant. All Israel is the chosen remnant. That is a subset, okay, a subset of Jewish believers within ethnic Israel that have been and will be saved up to the end of days. Makes sense. How many of you here believe God is the God of the impossible? God of the impossible. If God is God of the impossible, is it possible that at the end of the age, at the end of days, all of the Jewish people at that time will be saved? Is that impossible? Well, you might say yes, humanly, but with God, is that possible? It is possible. And that's why here we say, all Israel is ethnic Israel. The people of Israel will be saved at the end of days. They will eventually turn to Christ in accordance to God's promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let me show you a passage that Pastor Peter showed last Sunday so that we appreciate how this could happen. Zechariah 12, verses 9 and 10. It says in verse 9, And in that day I will set about, that's Jesus, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. You see, one of these days, in the end of days, there will be a, uh, a group, an aggrupation of nations that will come who in their minds once and for all destroy the nation of Israel. Now, depending on how you interpret a prophecy that could mean Russia, Iran, whoever it is. God knows who they are. But the point is, he says, I will destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That will be an amazing sight. And then it says in verse 10, I will pour out on the house of David, which is the Jewish people, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and the spirit of supplication. And they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Just imagine as they see Jesus and they realize who he really is, the entire nation of Israel falling on its knees and saying, Yeshua, you are the Lord and the Savior. Nothing is impossible with God. Now, I know one of my friends is clapping because he's very happy for the Jewish people, but you ask yourself, what does that mean to me today? Okay, just wait. I'll show you. Back to Romans. Romans. 
from the standpoint of the gospel, they, the Jews, are enemies for your sake. Meaning to say, remember what Paul said, they rejected the gospel so that the gospel will go to the Gentiles. So that was for your benefit, our benefit, all of us who are in this room. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Who are the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. For, read this with me, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The promises made to God, to the patriarchs, are irrevocable. And what did God say? What did God tell each of these three men? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promise is amazing. And this promise impacts not only the Jewish people, it impacts you and me. Look at what he said to Abraham, Genesis 12. I will make you a great nation, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Are you blessed to be a follower of Jesus today? Hallelujah. It's because of that promise. Next, he made the same promise to Isaac, Genesis 26. By your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. To Jacob, in spite of all of his, you know his story. In you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The second reason why we should respond humbly to the grace of God are his guarantees. Because he's not only a promise maker, he is a promise keeper. He is your God. He is our Savior. If God is sovereign over Israel's history, he is sovereign over your story. Whatever is happening in your life right now, and I know many of you are going through all kinds of things. You who are here, you who are online, but it's, if God is sovereign over the history of Israel, He is also sovereign over your personal history. Can I hear an amen? Amen. 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 But wait. <laughs> If God has been gracious to Israel, He will be gracious to you. And He already has. And here is the kicker. If God will keep His promises to Israel, He will keep His promises to you. And that's why this is important to you and me. And that's why Israel is the centerpiece of this whole thing. Now, as we end, three reasons. Remember, grafted by God the guarantees of God, and finally, we give glory to God. You know, even Paul, who was so smart, so well-educated, so full of the Spirit, at the end of Romans 11, you know what he said? This is about all I can do to explain it. But at the end of the day, it is God's incomprehensible divine sovereignty and wisdom. Why? What did he say at the end of Romans? Well, he said, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. And then he quotes from the Old Testament. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who became His counselor? Who could ever be in a position to give God ideas how to do His work? Nobody. And when we look at, remember we said, if he is sovereign over Israel's history, he's sovereign over your personal history. Let me tell you a little bit about my own story. Obviously, once upon a time, my heart was hardened, my spiritual eyes were blind, right? Now, once upon a time, sometime in the 1980s, there was an American man in America, the, <laughs> okay, <laughs> And he was not a Christian. But somebody shared the gospel with him. And he became a believer. Now, he was a lawyer and he was a businessman. But somehow God touched his heart. And he decided to become a missionary, a foreign missionary. Now, how many countries are there in the world? I don't know. But of all of the countries in the world, God brought him to the, guess where? Philippines, very good. And out of all of the, you know, um, 
types of people groups in the Philippines. He could have been a tribal missionary. He could have been a missionary down uh, in Mindanao. But God made him a missionary to working people, people in offices. He could have been a missionary in the offices in Cebu or somewhere else, but he brought him to Metro Manila. Now, you and I know in Metro Manila, there are many companies and many offices. But God brought him where? To the office where, guess who? Where I was working. First of all, he, got per he asked for permission to start a Bible study in our office. Amazingly, they gave him permission. Now, he invited somebody to the Bible study. He didn't invite me. He invited somebody. But that somebody invited, guess who? Me. And so I attended the Bible study. That person whom he invited, the missionary invited, who invited me, that person, as far as I know, until now is not yet a believer. But me, after two sessions in the Bible study, I gave my life to Jesus. But wait, and it's not because I'm a nice guy. It's all about the grace of God. But wait, rewind muna. <laughs> even before I gave my life to Jesus, even before God brought, brought that missionary here, I would drive to the office. I'd leave the house at 6 in the morning. I was still single at the time. I'd drive my car uh, from my house to the office at 6 in the morning. And for my half-hour drive, I would be listening to the radio. Out of all of the stations, well, you know me, I like Beatles, I like, you know, rock and roll. I was listening to Far East Broadcasting Company. Why in the world would a person like me listen to Far East, a Christian radio, the only Christian radio station in the Philippines that has classical music, Bible content, etc.? Why? I don't know. That's just what happened. So I can, and I realized, looking back, God was preparing my heart. And that's why when God brought this guy all the way from the U.S., out of all of the countries in the world, out of all of the cities in Metro Manila, out of all of the offices in Metro Manila, out of all of the departments that were there in that company, and somebody who was not even originally invited to the Bible study, now I'm here. If God is sovereign over Israel, He is sovereign over your story. If God has been gracious to Israel, He will be gracious to you. And if God keeps His promises to Israel, He will keep His promises to you. And so, whatever is the long and winding road of your life, God is with us. And so this is how Paul ends. Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? We owe Jesus everything. He owes us nothing. But we owe him everything. And that's why Paul says, For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So how do we respond humbly to God's grace? Let me show you a few things. You can take a picture. I'll just go through it quickly. Humble versus proud. Part of these were shared by Pastor Peter quite some time ago. First of all, humble. Admits need for Jesus' salvation. Proud relies on self-righteousness. In awe of God's grace. Just like today, we're in awe of His grace. Proud takes God's grace for granted. Humble has compassion for the lost. Proud feels spiritually superior. Humble rested in the sovereignty of God. Proud complains, grumbles. Humble is grateful. Humble, a proud is constantly compares with others or is discontent. Bakit siya? Forgives others. Angry, bitter, vengeful. Teachable. Reacts when criticized. Serves God and others. Puts self first. Rights are surrendered to God, feels entitled, and finally focuses on God's glory, proud, exalts self. So folks, you can, like I said, take a picture of that. 
And you can, together with God, have a time of, Lord, where can I improve? As we end our time together, I ask you this question. Remember, if the Lord Jesus were to appear in front of you right now, what is the first thing you would say or do? Folks, this is not a hypothetical question. This will happen someday. Because the Bible tells us, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus doesn't have to appear here. He is here. He is. Let's bow our heads together. I pray that we are all refreshed and humbled in a new way towards the grace of God. Because indeed, by His sovereign choice, we've been grafted, we've been included in His family. By His amazing grace, His promises are true. By His amazing grace, He deserves all the glory because His ways are inscrutable. His love and compassion are unfathomable. And I pray today that indeed, if you have heard His voice, you will not harden your heart. And you will just open yourself to Jesus. And as He seeks to welcome you into His fold with open arms, you will run to Him with open arms as well and say, Lord Jesus, You are Lord. You are Savior. And today you are my, my Lord and my Savior. I give you my life. I give you my soul. I give you all of me. Lord Jesus, do that work that only you can do in my life. Help me to walk in assurance that someday I'll be with you. But between now and then, help me to live for you, to please you to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless us, everyone.